1946. Europe has 99 problems, but a dictator ain't one. A, a genocidal dictator. A fascist dic... A genocidal fascist German dictator ain't one. Booyah! Unfortunately, it still had 99 other problems. Famine, energy shortage, housing shortage, unemployment, monetary instability, trade imbalances, foreign exchange shortages, social discontent, communist subterfuge, industrial decline, things were... not great. But this is a happy episode, you know why? Because Europe fixed it. And because America saw a series of complicated, interconnected problems that primarily affected impoverished people on the other side of the world, and they invested in helping to fix it. With their government. Now my friends, the smoldering ruins of the Western Front can be rebuilt, but one thing that can't is your hairline. One in three men will experience hair loss by the time they're 35, so treat your hair right. Treat it with Keeps. Keeps is an online subscription service that makes it easy and more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness from the comfort of their own home, without any trips to the doctor's office or the pharmacy. And at half the pharmacy price, too. That's why Keeps has over 4,500 five-star reviews. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has you covered. Over one million men have kept their hair thanks to Keeps expert recommended treatment options, and their hair thickening shampoo and conditioner are formulated to make your hair strong and healthy as can be. Go to keeps.com slash jackrackham today to get started. This is a video about the Marshall Plan, where America gave Europe lots of money to rebuild after it had finished blowing itself up over... Uh, I don't know, silly Hitler reasons. But believe it or not, getting America to pay attention to international politics for more than two seconds is historically challenging. Now, like every post-World War II video, I need to talk about the Atlantic Charter. It was a thing that Prime Minister Churchill and President FDR wrote together. They said a bunch of stuff, but right now it's important because they said when the war was over, they wanted everybody to trade freely with the world. That was how America was going to get rich and dominate half the world, but it was also how Europe was going to rebuild, and America followed the spirit of their promise to the letter, almost until the war ended. When America was almost ready to win the war, the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, whose job was not war, was standing around the water cooler and he heard the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, talking about all this free trade and stuff that was gonna happen after Germany surrendered. Morgenthau said, Ooh, hey, love what you're doing, couple notes for ya. Morgenthau was afraid of Germany starting World War III in another 10 years, so his pitch was to turn the country into an agricultural society, like some kind of latent Jeffersonian wet dream. Germany had only been able to grow its population as large as it was because of industry. Secretary of State Hull tried to warn him that, if we do your plan, 40% of Germans will die. So Morgenthau went over his head and knocked on the president's door instead. Morgenthau continued to pester the president with his ideas until he gave Cordell Hull a stress-eating disorder and sent him to the hospital. As a result, Hull couldn't make it to a very important meeting with Winston Churchill because he resigned due to health complications. So FDR took Morgenthau to the meeting instead. Churchill said, If we do your plan, Britain's economy will suffer. It would be like chaining us to a corpse. But Morgenthau proceeded to use six billion dollars in aid to make Churchill agree with him. When the war is over, President FDR is dead, and in line with Morgenthau's thinking, President Truman signs the order that says Germany can't be rebuilt too much. Industrial production would be reduced to provide the same standard of living as 1932. The peak of the depression when people were buying bread with wheelbarrows of cash. Two months later, Morgenthau got too big for his britches. He demanded that he accompany the president to the meeting of the Allied leaders in Potsdam, and told Truman that either he was going to the meeting, or he was going to quit. Truman accepted his resignation. 
Still, it would take a couple of years for things to begin to change. Morgenthau's Stick It to the Germans plan was quite popular. FDR had liked it, Eisenhower liked it, the American public liked it. But in 1947, President Truman sent much maligned former President Herbert Hoover, of all people, to go on a tour of Europe to assess the food needs of Germany and Austria. Yeah, you know how Cordell Hall said that 32 million people will starve to death if we listen to Morgenthau? 25 million people are about to starve to death. Uh-huh. And if we don't feed them, they're gonna try communism. Gadzooks! So Truman calls up his new Secretary of State, George Marshall, and says, I've got a very important job for you. We need to stop Germany from starving to death. Let's see if the Soviets are willing to help us get German industry back up and running. A MILLION DEAD IN STALINGRAD! GERMANY MUST NOT RISE AGAIN! They didn't love it. Didn't think so. Alright, new plan. June 1947. Truman calls a very important press conference where he gives some very important answers to some very important questions. By which I mean the whole thing was a distraction, an elaborate ruse meant to draw the media's attention because the new plan involved something the American public might not be so happy about spending a lot of money overseas on something other than fighter jets and H-bombs. George Marshall delivered the real speech at Harvard. No American journalists had been contacted, but he'd arranged for the entire thing to be broadcast in Europe. The modern system of the division of labor, upon which the entire modern world is built, is in danger of breaking down. Europe needs to rebuild. All of Europe. And America wants to help. The catch, my European friends, is that if you want this money, you'll have to band together. The British and French foreign ministers are listening on the other end. They hurry to contact diplomatic leaders across the continent. They assemble a meeting in Paris, which would be like a precursor to a precursor to a precursor to what would eventually become the EU. But not everyone was on board. What are the communists doing here? Comrade Stalin is not above taking free money? I don't believe it. I never thought you'd come around to economic cooperation and free trade. This could be the beginning. Cooperation? You want us to cooperate? Fascist pigs! You dogs! We create our own Marshall Plan with unequal treaties and undiversified import-dependent economies. Come, Poland! Come, Yugoslavia! <coughs> we are leaving. After the Soviet Union called upon the communists of the world to sabotage the Marshall Plan, the remaining 16 countries got together to work out their conditions and priorities and deliver them to the Americans. The Truman administration reminded them, warily, that whatever they agreed upon would still have to pass through Congress, which was currently controlled by the Republicans. The Republican Party at the time was of two minds. One wing was of internationalists, who supported the Democrat-led Marshall Plan and just wanted to make some cosmetic changes to it so it would look like they did something. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the 17 representatives of the Herder Committee have spoken to key decision makers in nearly every European country. And we can say, with confidence, that communism is when people are poor. So if we make people not poor, then there's no more communism. The other wing of the party wanted to take America back to isolationism, to wipe their hands of Europe and definitely not face any consequences. There was debate in the House. Interventionalists talked about whether the program could be expanded to include Turkey and China. The isolationists debated how thin they could stretch any funding. But ultimately, who should come out of the woodwork to write a letter to the Speaker championing the Marshall Plan and a guiding voice for the Republican Party to turn the isolationists around but Herbert Daggum Hoover? Nice work, Hooves. And with that, the Marshall Plan was a go. And it was a really clever piece of work, too, because all this time, I've been describing it as the US giving money to Europe, but the reality was so much cooler than that. Even cooler than that. Cooler than that, too. 
So remember all the problems that we had. European countries are over budget and in debt. Europeans are not producing enough to get their economies up and running and can't afford to import the difference. As a result, American businesses don't have anyone to buy their exports. The solution was something like this. European and American producers visited each other's countries, allowing them to exchange skills and advice and get a better sense of what Europe needed and how much. American producers then donated their materials, equipment, and technology, and the US government paid them back by buying their stocks. When the goods arrived in Europe, they were handled by the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, sort of a uh, precursor to a precursor to the EU, or something like that. The goods were then distributed to the governments of the different countries of Europe, who in turn sold them to their own citizens using their own currencies. So now, guess what? American businesses have a booming export market. The American government can reimburse itself by selling stock in growing American businesses. Europeans are getting the resources they need to rebuild their industry, and European countries have cash money. And because the goods are being purchased in Europe for European currency, large amounts of that currency is leaving the market, curbing inflation, and there's an increased demand for those currencies, bringing their value back in line with the dollar. There's like 15 birds getting killed with this one stone. I just can't look away. It would be a bit chauvinistic to claim that the Marshall Plan single-handedly saved all of Europe. Like, things were already starting to move in the direction of recovery, but regardless of degree, the Marshall Plan seemed to accomplish everything it set out to do. By 1950, European industrial output exceeded pre-war levels, and it fostered European economic collaboration, which would only continue to grow stronger. And Western Europe did, in fact, do less communism after the Marshall Plan, despite Stalin's hissy fit. And Germany started getting its fascism nostalgia back down to comfortable levels. That's it! That's the message we're ending on today. For once, just a good, wholesome story about what can be achieved in politics when smart people put their heads together in an honest attempt to solve 99 challenging problems. A breath of fresh air compared to, say, the covert activities of the Eisenhower administration. But that is a story for another time. Thank you